evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 33rd year, I talk to writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished, what they might be planning for the future. It's a slightly wider net, however. We have had on painters, musicians, sculptors. If you have an idea for a writer who might be a good fit for the writer's block or another variety of artists, please watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd love to get your suggestions. Also, I want to remind you again that the writer's block and all the original programming that comes out of 1623 Studios is the result of cable access television. It's really a valuable, important community asset for Cape Ann, and you don't get it with DISH or other means of accessing the World Wide Web. So you stick with cable, stick with the writer's block. I want you to notice my uh, paraphernalia today, my dress, my t-shirt, sweatshirt, Gloucester, because today we're going to talk to an editor, a writer by the name of well, I should get her name right. I want to make sure I get her name right. Carrie Weber Mangos, who is very involved with the Gloucester 400th anniversary, which, if you haven't heard, is next year. Welcome to the Writer's Block, Carrie. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. I want to ask you what I asked you before the show started. Sure. Where are you from originally? I grew up in Northboro, Mass., which is basically central Massachusetts, between Worcester and Framingham. It's a small town. How big? Bigger than Gloucester? I think it's uh, about 15,000, 16,000 people, although it may have gotten a little bit bigger since I left there. So. <laughs> and how did you find... Well, you went to school in, Glau in Northboro. In Northboro. Northboro. Yeah. And then you went to college? I went to college at Pine Manor College, which has uh, recently become part of Boston College. Part of Boston College. Right. Was it independent? Was it... All women's college. It's an at the all time. women's college. It's in and Chestnut now it, Hill. Now yep. it merged with the uh, co-ed, uh, bigger co-ed yes. university. Yeah. Next question. And this I found this very interesting when we were chatting before the show. How did you find Gloucester? Well, um, in 2008, my I had been living uh, in Northboro. I had moved back home to take care of my dad, and unfortunately, he passed away. Um, and after that, I decided I just wanted to have a new start. And I, the only thing I knew is that I wanted to live near the ocean. And I literally had a paper map, and I had it on the table, and I just kind of flipped it around. It was like the coastline of New England, and my finger landed on Gloucester. <laughs> I have no ties here. I had no ties here. Your finger um, was guided by some, <laughs> some force, I think. True story. A lot of people say, no, that didn't really happen. It happened. I, just, it. I didn't know where I wanted to go. Was Did Gloucester. you close your eyes? and? Yeah, I, I think I closed my eyes. I know I wasn't looking at the map, so I must have either looked away or closed my eyes. You made a eyes. good choice. A, <laughs> I think so. It's I think a great so. city. Now, you're extremely involved with, I want to go back. I asked you this question. I try to ask it for, for everybody. What was your major in college, and what gave you an inclination towards that major? In college, I majored in English. And I think I'm going to give my parents credit for helping me become a writer and uh, giving me the ability to help other writers because they really valued education. And my dad would quite often take us to a big library on the weekends where we thought, when we were kids, we thought it was exciting to go in and check out as big of a stack of books as we could get, however many that was, five or six books. My dad would also get a stack of books, and he made it fun for us. So I'd like to read. Library's exciting. And then eventually I'd love, I'd love to write. One of the author of Wallace's favorite lines was, he always wanted to work this into a story, the library quick, step on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I wanted to ask that because it's important how people learn about language and mm -hmm. learn their love for language. You are involved more than almost anybody else in Gloucester. With Gloucester, you are the coordinating director for the Gloucester 400 Stories Project. Did I get that? Kind of. I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm the Stories Project leader for the, for the actual Stories Project. Someone else is directing the entire organization. Okay. But I, um, my project is the Stories Project. Tell us what that is. Um, so basically, I think most people know that next year, 2023, Gloucester is going to be celebrating its 
400th um, anniversary, if you will. Uh, and as part of that, it's going to look back at 400 plus years of history. Um, so, and the Stories Project is going to try to capture people's stories from that history from 400 plus years ago. Um, and not just people from the past, but people today. So you're going to see pro profiles of great people from today as well. Uh, so it's my job to collect those stories, to try and find those stories. Uh, once I get them, to edit the story itself. Sometimes I write the story. I've written a couple of the stories. Uh, but mostly I'm editing other people's work. And then those stories eventually become published online. And next year, we are hoping to have a commemorative book that has some of those select stories in there. And I say select stories because if I'm going to collect 400 stories, I really can't have one <laughs> book with 400 stories in it. So we have to yeah. have a selection process. Also, as part of that, people should know um, that the stories are not just going to be written. They're also going to be in video. They're also going to be told in the form of poetry as well. So. I was glad to see that recently in yes. the Gloucester Times. They did a spread about they're expanding the, the scope of art as, as, yes. the, as the writer's block has, yep. not just writing, but exactly. videotaping, poetry. Well, poetry is writing, but other, other styles you know, right. combined with the, the words themselves. Yes, and uh, so, many, so much of the, the student generation is into making videos, et cetera. So it, it's going to capture a lot of the stories they want to tell by video as well. So that's, and that's prominent. Uh, the 400 Stories Project is a prominent uh, menu item on the Gloucester 400 website. Absolutely. Which is, which is going to be presented on the, uh, during the show so that people can go to it mm -hmm. and then easily find the 400 Stories Project. Right. One story or poem or video for every year in the 400 year history? Well, I don't know that we can capture every year specifically, but it's, we're going to try to capture something from each time frame or each um, major event, um, different groups in town. But as the, well. the number 400 is, reflects the, the, birthday, the birthday year. It reflects the birthday year, yeah. What is the number you're up to right now? Well, there's been 33 stories published. Uh, we have about 100 in the queue. And that includes about 30 videos uh, that are waiting to be published. And when I say they're waiting to be published, I mean someone has to review them. So someone usually me. <laughs> <laughs> someone has to review them, edit them, and make sure that we can uh, publish them. So you meet um, every morning with your staff of 50 to discuss. I meet with myself. <laughs> There's no disagreement. Actually, so. in all seriousness, we are just uh, starting to get together a very great group of volunteers who I hope can help edit and process the stories a little bit faster um, as you get closer to the, the quote unquote deadline of 2023. There is a, um, there is a, a lot a, more people come forward. They want, they're, and they're hearing more about this project, so they want to help out. So, so the your deadline, I, I believe it says on the website, is this year, 20. Yes, well, 2022, December? We would it? like to get all the stories or videos in before December of this year. However, we will see what it looks like at that point yeah. and then have to adjust the deadline possibly. Ideally, they would be ready for 2023. Yes. Uh, and, and edited and. Compiled. I'm envisioning that the book would come out in the early fall of 2023, so in time to give it as a Christmas gift for however you want to celebrate. Oh, so about, so. about a year, a little over a year from. Yeah. When this show, uh, when this writer's block show yes. goes on the air. Well, maybe next year I can come on the show and show off the book. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, that's, that, so everything's going to be uh, visual, going to mm -hmm. be on the Gloucester 400 website, mm -hmm. and then later in hard copy. Yeah. And will those be sold, or will those be given away at City Hall in a, in a mad rush? You know, to be honest with you, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think they're going to be sold. I, I don't know how they're going to be distributed, but that's something I have to figure out when I get to the, the book process of this, which I'm not near yet. I figure when I get to about 200 stories, I better start thinking about the book. <laughs> so that's going to be a big book, even if you, you can't do every, everything. Right. And, you're, and it's going to be print. Not, right. It's not going to have uh, videotapes falling out of it. Exactly. Uh, uh, or chips, I should say, yeah. videotapes that are reflecting my age. We'll have, some, we'll have some information in the back listing where everyone can find the videos and, and um, 
any other information we gather, like any other places that people can find out about Gloucester. Will the Gloucester 400 website continue through and past 2023? I believe so it will. That, that is the hope. So people can go to that site for the videos mm -hmm. or to read the, the written uh, copy. Yes. I, th I believe the website will always exist. Um, so the stories will always be in one place. Uh, what it's going to be called after the 400, I don't know. It might have to change the name because it won't be the 400 anymore. But Maybe you sell the books and the money could go to keeping the, keeping the website active. Yeah, true. That's yeah. an idea. <laughs> I don't well, know that yet. You're learning an awful lot about Gloucester. I'm sure you know more about Gloucester already than half of us who live in Gloucester. Um, what has been the most exciting or amazing idea or piece of writing that you've seen come across your desk? Oh, I am being sincere when I say this. So many of the stories are interesting to me for various reasons, but off the top of my head, I'll probably say that um, there was a woman who uh, emigrated here uh, from Italy, and she, her English is not her first language. Uh, her name is Antoinetta, and a lot of people know her as the person who takes care of the gardens on the boulevard. And she wanted to tell her family story, so she just started writing it. And um, she had help some with, from some friends and family, but she submitted the story to the 400. And then we took the um, took excerpts from her book, because it's a book at length at this point, and published them online. But it was an amazing story of a little girl coming from Italy, um, su having survived a major earthquake there. I mean, her town was in ruins, her house was in ruins. So she and her sisters came here. With their mom, they had to leave the father behind because uh, all the men were told to stay back in Italy to help rebuild. Um, and so she came here alone with her mom. Uh, unfortunately, they had some extended family here who helped them out. And uh, so she was able to tell that story and get help telling it from the 400. And I think that that's another kind of, um, it's not just about telling stories, it's also helping people give them a voice and help them polish their writing skills as well. So there's so many different avenues of why this is a great project and why I love the project. You said to me before, oh, I, I can tell you really love this project. <laughs> and I yes, really do. I, I could. Because there's so many good things about it that come from it. And one of that was giving that lady her voice, her ability to tell her story. So yeah, you, when, when we first talked, uh, I could tell instantly you liked it because you were very, uh, very amenable to change, mm -hmm. and you were you laughed occasionally as, <laughs> as, as you do as you have here, and uh, we're we're open to ideas. And uh, I've worked with editors who are not so. Uh, that that's uh, that's a wonderful story about the woman who came here as a child mm -hmm. after an earthquake. Yeah. And um, another thing that, um, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, is that we're really looking for stories from people who have been unheard or have a story to tell and haven't had a way to tell it. Um, so one of the examples of that would be recently we published the story of Nancy Gardner Prince. She was a black woman who lived there in the late 1700s and early 1800s. She wrote a memoir even back then. And not too many people in Gloucester are familiar with it. Uh, so to see, have this woman's voice in her own words and highlighted in the 400 Project is a grand example of what we'd like to see, even from people now who, they're not necessarily celebrities, local celebrities, et cetera. They're just regular people who are good people who want to tell a story. And you are looking for those. Yes, absolutely. Stories. Now, say her name again. The Gloucester Times did a, a feature uh, about her and mm -hmm. about that presentation. Say her name again. Nancy Gardner Prince. Nancy Gardner Prince. And she wrote a memoir in the 18th century. Uh, yes, in the early 1800s, she wrote it. 19th um, So she, um, it's an amazing thing for her to be able to do at that time. Yes. So just reading it is, it's really an experience. And that's available now. Yes. On the 400 Stories it is. website, mm -hmm. which is part of the Gloucester 400 website. Yeah. Tell okay. me what, yeah, now there's people watching us, uh, and they <laughs> think, well, I can't write, but my Uncle Frank was really an interesting guy. What do they do if they want to get uh, a, a story or a profile to you? What, what's so the if someone, someone has a good idea, they can go to 
the website, which is, um, I don't know if you're going to show the website later, but it's www.glossarma400.org. And right on there, when you just click on the stories, there's a link for how to submit a story or a story idea. So even if you're not a good writer yourself and you really insist on someone else writing it, we will find a writer, whether it's myself or someone else, to write the story for you. So you have people, volunteers, yes. to uh, help writers who are, or would-be writers who contact you. Yes. Uh, so you go to the Gloucester 400 website, gloucesterma400.org. And on the top banner, one of the uh, items on the menu list is 400 Stories Project. And yes. that has uh, that's a drop-down menu with all the items you mentioned. Submission guidelines, where to submit your story, uh, frequently asked questions, et cetera. So, so that's really step one for everyone. Step one is going to the website and just simply looking at, at what's there. Looking at the previously published stories so you have an idea of what your story is going to uh -huh. look like when it comes out. And then looking at the submission guidelines. I really encourage anyone to read the submission guidelines before they start writing the story so that they don't have to backtrack later and right. fix something or right. whatever. Um, so that is definitely step number one. And then just getting to a draft, if say you are, uh, feel confident enough to write your draft, write the draft and send it in. And then we go from there, editing and to publishing. So there's nothing to be afraid of. I know people no. are shy about their writing skills if they, they didn't finish uh, grade school or high school and, uh, or didn't like English no, and, and I'm not a really but, harsh editor. I won't be mean to people. <laughs> no, yeah, good, good, good. So that's a wonderful thing to say. You won't be mean. I will not good, be mean to good, people. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, I know there are people who watch uh, who think about writing. That's why they watch the show many times uh, and are very, very shy about it. And I try to give room to people uh, to be on the show who uh, who have published something but don't have their they don't have uh, Penguin uh, access right. uh, to uh, to uh, PR people, uh, so that's that's good to know. So they can contact you through the website mm -hmm. and send in, according to the guidelines, what they've written, or or just an call idea. Call write and and ask for help with an idea. Yes. So if I want to call in and say, "Well, Uncle Frank, I want to you talk about Uncle Frank. That. He was just a crazy character in town." Uh, I could work with somebody. Yeah, and um, that brings me, it reminds me that, like I say, we, we want to hear from uh, just regular everyday people who happen to be good people that people are react to. So there's a great story about Elsie Lawson, a woman who, who was... Who is it? What's her name again, please? Elsie Lawson. Elsie Lawson. Yeah, she, she, um, she was raising a family here in the 1930s. She didn't have a lot of money. Her family didn't have a lot of money, but they were hardworking. They were providing for their family. In fact, they were providing for food for other children in the neighborhood. And it just really is a good reminder of that everything wasn't easy in the past. And some people had to live through World War II and stay at home and try to keep their families together and, you know, living in fear half the time. Mm -hmm. So many different eras of time where people were facing all these challenges, but they were great people. They did so much for their neighbors and their own families, and everybody pulling together to get through those times has really been Elsie Lawson, is the name of the story. Actually, the title of the story is My Nana Elsie, written by her grandson. My Nana. Yeah. Uh, I have read uh, several of the stories on the, um, on the um, website. And uh, I'm not going to remember titles immediately. They'll come in 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> but I found myself not knowing the people who wrote it, not knowing, except for the content of that story, the person they're speaking of, and starting to tear up because it's so moving to see someone honestly, openly, emotionally talking about a loved one who was important to them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what community is right. and, uh, at the core. And to, to see that over and over again on the website really is an important contribution that you're making and the 400 committee is making to this, uh, to this anniversary. Exactly. It's a so great after, committee. After our show goes out to our thousands and thousands of viewers, 
who will be inundated with applications. <laughs> I want to go back to an earlier topic and revisit it because it's the core of, uh, of what's on the site. Can you name a couple other uh, stories that, uh, that moved you or you thought were, thought were, were interesting? Um, one of them that comes to mind is uh, Caesar Rowland. Uh, this, the title of Will the story say is... Say that again a louder, please. Louder. Um, Caesar Rowland. The title of the story is King of the Hill. And it's, I haven't read that. It's about a, a Portuguese gentleman. He came here from Portugal, and he uh, made a life for himself here. He ended up own, um, operating a corner market up on Friend Street. And he didn't just run a, a little drugstore or a little market. He was the guy everyone went to. Uh, that if they needed some kind of help, whether they needed advice, whether they needed some groceries that week and they didn't have enough money to pay for them, he would simply write out an IOU that sometimes was never paid back to him. Or if a kid in the neighborhood couldn't afford a baseball glove, they would go to him and get it. He took care of the park across the street from him. I think it's called Middleton Park now on Front Street. Um, so he would, he would make it his business to keep that park clean and raise the flag in the park, et cetera. So he was, it's called King of the Hill because, well, not only was he living on a hill, but um, he was the guy everybody went to. And years later, his, um, there's still a Facebook page devoted to him and his community uh, commitment. So he died, and I believe it was the early 2000s. And so I think in like 2002, I can't be exact about the year that he passed away. But so 20 years later, people are still talking about him and all the great things he did, just being a regular guy trying to help people out. The park you mentioned, I'm not sure if I got the name right. It's a park from which there are stairs going down towards Main Street, concrete stairs, about 30 of them. Um. I don't there, think there's a stairway that's that long, but it is right on Friend Street. It's called Middleton Park, and it's, it's, it's fairly small. Um, but it may have been bigger at one point, but it's fairly small. Um, definitely a, a neighborhood park. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah, I went there to actually take a picture of the memorial. There's a memorial there for him. That's how important he was for the, that neighborhood and the community. So. I'm thinking of a little park that concrete stairs go up. From, from not directly from Main Street, but off a little alley from Main Street, go up, and they were used in the movie Manchester by the Sea, oh, which no. was filmed almost all, all entirely in Gloucester. Yeah, it's misnamed, <laughs> misnamed movie, but that's the stairway I'm thinking of. I'll have to. Go. I didn't notice a stairway like that when I was there. Could I'll be. have to go check that after I leave the studio today. Can you think of? Well, we don't have an awful lot of time left. Can you think of uh, another story? that might inspire our audience to send their stories in. That's kind of an example of a person who uh, wasn't a celebrity. Well, actually, I just published a, a short story, and it's not on the website yet, but it's on Facebook right now. And it's called A Tale of Two Rogers. It literally came out yesterday or today. And what it is is about a guy named Roger Lawson who was duck hunting. This is, um, I want to say it was in the 1940s, but I have to check the year. But he was duck hunting. No, it was during the Depression. So it was in the 30s. Um, and he was, that's how he got food for his family. It wasn't just for sport. And he was with his dog to help him retrieve the duck that he shot. And it started raining. So he was walking back home. And uh, he's carrying dead ducks. He's got his smelly wet dog, and he's soaked as well. And a really fancy car pulls up, and the guy inside says, do you want to ride home? And so this person, Roger, was like, okay. <laughs> so he got in the, the limo, and it was Roger um, Babson. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up the story a little bit, because the person who got in the car, his name was Bill Lawson. Okay, he um, got in the car took a ride home with Roger Babson, who obviously was a wealthy uh, person and a well-known person who didn't necessarily need to have anybody wet and, and kind of smelly in his car with the dog and all that. So he got a ride home, and when, he, um, when Bill got home, his pregnant wife was there to greet him, and she was 
panicked because when she saw a big fancy black car pull up, she thought it was a hearse bringing him home. <laughs> so, <laughs> what a sad thought. Whoa. So she's, she's like, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. He said, Roger Babson just gave me a ride home. So the interesting part about that isn't so much the celebrity of Roger Babson, but they named their child. So she was pregnant. They named their child Roger after him. Good story. And, uh, he hadn't, became Roger Lawson. The Babsons, of course, are famous in Gloucester. was one of his ancestors who had Dogtown uh, engravings done on the rock. Yeah, on the and rock. so uh, it's interesting how we had two different parts of the community come together like that, and it makes a great story. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I'm not sure I'd pick up somebody who was probably carrying a <laughs> rifle, dead ducks, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If My I car would wouldn't fit them anyway. It was a different age <laughs> That's than, true. than what they were in right now. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad you shared that story, and I, I do hope that will uh, encourage some people to. Uh, See, that's to that's contact. what I mean. That was a moment in time, and somebody might think that's not a story, but it's a moment in time that shows something about community. So it can be a vignette or a yeah. Brief it doesn't thousand. have to be like I said. It doesn't have to be some grand story. It could be a small, special moment in time. So people thinking of sending in material shouldn't think, oh, I've got to have exposition, then I've got to have development, then I've got to have denouement. Oh, my God, no, I this can't is do just it. a great moment that was shared with us, yeah. and we couldn't wait to put it out there, yeah. so we put it on Facebook. I want to ask you, I, I often ask uh, writers and editors this question. I'm going to go back to education. What would you advise people who want to write, not necessarily for the 400, but they just they want to get into writing, and they don't know where to start, what should they do? Uh, the first thing I'd probably tell someone is to keep a journal. And that doesn't have to be a long and sophisticated journal. Uh, every couple of days, I would write something in a journal about something that made you feel something, whether it was happiness, sadness, anger. Write about something you felt. And then later on, when you have time, come back to it and write a little story about why you felt that way. And uh, Share it with people and get their comments on it. And then just keep polishing that one story. As I mentioned to you, I just do this one story at a time. Even yeah. though you're keeping a journal of many different moments, take that moment, number one moment, and just make that into a story. So keep a journal. Yeah. Keep a journal and take your experiences out of there and write some short stories. Share it with people and get their opinions. And keep polishing it till you feel like it's in a good place. That's interesting. Often the guests, the writers will say uh, something almost exactly like that. Write. Mm -hmm. Writing Don't is the best way. Don't wait for the big idea. Write to keep a journal. Keep a diary. Write and take journal. advice from editors. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. Well, take 95% of the advice. Sometimes you feel so strongly about something, and you need to keep it exactly how it was. Cause that's what yeah. you want to say. But all the other stuff that doesn't really matter as well, much, take an editor's advice. We are out of time. This went well. I'm really happy to have you, uh, Terry Weber. I'm happy Mangos. you asked me. <laughs> it was a good half hour, and I hope that our audience has uh, learned something about your and the 400 Project in, in general. Thanks for I being hope so. with us. Thank you so much. I want to thank everybody in, where am I? Ah, there I am. I want to thank everybody in TV land as well for being with us and learning something about Harry Weber Mangos's job at Gloucester 400 Stories. Go to the website, check it out. Beautiful writing, beautiful pictures, and you can be a part of that. I hope to see you again next week on the Writer's Block. Good night.